Yeah, so I, I do think a lot about formal verification, uh, and um, that, that wasn't part of what I was gonna talk about, but I, I wanna say a few words um, since Yashua brought it up, and uh, since it didn't appear on that list of uh, top priority things. Uh, basically, in uh, the 2010s, so 2013 to 2017, DARPA showed through the Hackums project that it is possible to create uh, software systems that are completely free of exploitable bugs uh, in the software domain. Now, that, of course, there's still uh, ways of supply chain attacks or electromagnetic attacks for getting physical access to hardware systems. Uh, but in the software domain, um, it, the defender just wins in the limit of uh, uh, the maximum defender capability and maximum offense capability. The defender just wins. And uh, with AI automation of formal verification, um, that should become much cheaper and more scalable. And I think it's important that we get there as soon as possible. Um, and I think uh, among people who've looked at this, it's like not actually very controversial. It's not like new research needs to be done into uh, the mathematical possibility of unhackable software, like clearly is possible, um, but a lot of development needs to be done, like adding NVIDIA drivers to SEL4 and formally verifying them, which will take a lot of cognitive labor, some of which maybe can be automated already. So I think that's very important. Uh, what I think is uh, less clearly possible is uh, securing the hardware against electro electromagnetic and physical attacks. So that's actually what I'm mainly gonna talk about. Um, and so uh, background, because this hasn't been brought up, probably everyone knows this, but just to um, uh, establish common knowledge or definitions. Um, so confidentiality is like no one can read your data. Integrity is no one can mess with your data. Availability is no one can erase your data or stop you from uh, being able to run a computation. Um, and so these are like the core properties of information security, um, which I'll then refer to in the sort of definition or requirements of what is a FlexEgg. So FlexEgg as a concept, which is um, uh, really as a set of requirements requirements or, or sort of specifications that uh, that must be met in order for something to be considered a flex egg, according to me. Um, and, and then there's also uh, kind of use cases, uh, which will be the next slide, and then after that, like a uh, feasibility analysis so that I think is, a, you know, uh, some evidence that it's feasible by breaking the problem down into six smaller problems, uh, but which are still not all completely solved. Um, but starting with the specifications, which is really what uh, defines flex egg. So first of all, uh, FlexEgg, uh, as compared to other like hardware-enabled security mechanisms or like Intel Management Engine or things like that, um, uh, should be uh, trustworthy to the owner that it will not facilitate violations of the owner's confidentiality or integrity. Um, so it will not be used as a tool for uh, some uh, authority to surveil what's happening on the system um, in a way that is uh, you know, covert, regardless of any future updates to its firmware. So that requires some particular design choices to be made. Uh, the second criterion is uh, that uh, any functions that are sort of core to it being a flex egg, um, including uh, functions that, uh, that you sort of put in optionally, like location verification, um, should be able to work in an air-gapped configuration or a half air-gapped configuration, sometimes called a data diode configuration, uh, where data can flow in, but no data can flow out physically. And so there are ways of doing location verification where you have uh, satellites orbiting that transmit cryptographically authenticated streams constantly, and you could receive those uh, with an antenna and pipe them in through a data diode and do location verification without actually phoning home. Um, that is to say, without uh, providing a new channel for, um, for covert surveillance. Um, and I think it's important that also we be able to do this so that when we have very high risk AI systems that we want to avoid giving any potential channel capacity to the outside world, the security measures that we're using to secure them don't require creating some kind of potential loophole for data to escape to the outside world of any kind. So I think that's a very important constraint for the long-term long AI safety security intersection. Uh, the third uh, constraint is uh, kind of the core function from a governance point of view, which is that, uh, that governments or the governance authority um, should be able to uh, impose constraints on availability, so policies that, that prevent certain computations from being runnable on this hardware. And unlike with confidentiality and integrity, where the owner should be able to trust um, the systems on their side, with availability, it's the governance mechanism that should be able to trust the systems on their side, um, controlling availability, uh, regardless of what the owner tries to do, even if the owner has covert help from uh, foreign governments. Uh, now, of course, uh, 
the you know uh, in the limit you can always you know crush a machine or you know slice it open um, but if you if you do a physical attack like that it should fail bricked so it should fail in such a way that it's not useful anymore it doesn't have any data you can access anymore um, and I think that's possible uh, fourth criterion is uh, that the owner should be able to trust the hardware will not impair availability except according to transparently disclosed policies. Um, so there's some cryptographic mechanism for updating policies, and policies need to be authorized. They need to be um, they need to be public to a certain extent, although they can include confidential data that's used for evaluations of NatSec things, for example. Um, but there shouldn't be any kind of secret uh, lever that uh, the governance mechanism has to just sort of shut down your inference operation without that being uh, disclosed. Uh, the fifth uh, criterion is policy should be updatable by a smart contract like cryptographic mechanism. So it's not like you, this, this is what makes it a flexible hardware enabled governance mechanism. It's not like you bake in a policy to the firmware, um, but actually the policy should be updatable um, really quite fast, like every 10 minutes maybe, um, so that this can be used as a, uh, a mechanism also for emergency response to, to uh, some kind of AI catastrophe. Uh, and uh, the policy updating rules should be updatable as well, so that this can be, be begin as um, perhaps a unilateral or minilateral and evolve towards a more multilateral governance mechanism without needing to retool and produce a new batch of hardware. Um, so as a cryptographic mechanism, should be able to have a quorum to change the quorum. Uh, and the updates should also be able to irreversibly restrict the set of potential future policies so that credible commitments can be made that this mechanism won't be used to restrict certain types of things. Uh, and uh, all this should scale to arbitrary cluster size with uh, you know minimal operational costs that is not fatal. Uh, and the final uh, uh, final point here is you know your cryptographic mechanisms. If you have a hardware security module that is uh, running things at line speed so that it's uh, scalable, you know put in there so that your best uh, best hardware accelerator for a post quantum system because you might need that before the hardware lifetime is up. Um, and uh, then what this enables you to do is things like uh, for uh, computations that exceed certain limits uh, or do certain things like do RL uh, or use training data that involves biological sequence, uh, uh, you want to require some evals for that. Uh, you don't want people to be able to run big computations with certain properties um, without it conforming to a certain shape that includes certain evals. Uh, you might want to uh, encrypt the model weights during training above a certain threshold and only allow their extraction um, after pro uh, you know, your, your uh, evaluation protocols come up green. You might want to run automated red teaming protocols where uh, you invoke the accelerator to run another AI system as an adversary that tries to d discover new attacks um, and require that to come up green before you can extract the weights. Um, you could even do benefit sharing so you could have um, uh, weights with certain certain capabilities be unusable for inference by anybody until they are cryptographically shared with uh, all parties to an agreement that uh, you know whoever gets there first will share the capabilities with everyone. Um, but you can uh, share the capabilities using capabilities-based access control. An unfortunate name collision actually means something completely different. Capabilities-based access control means that you're giving fine-grained access to do certain things with the data and not others. So you could give access to run inference but not fine-tuning. Um, you could you. Could, you know, and you can give that access with sovereign control. So it's not that like an API access where you give access to inference, but then the person who's giving the access can later revoke it and it has some leverage. Uh, you could be running it on your own hardware in such a way that the grantor cannot revoke access, but you also can't do fine tuning. So that I think is possible. Uh, and you could even have inference uh, compute limits uh, and, 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 and speed limits, and you could even have those be global. So you could have a, uh, a crypto token that is kind of like a taxi medallion for running advanced RL agents, and you could have only 50,000 of them in the world, uh, and you know people could bid and trade them, but you, you won't have like a nation of geniuses in a data center. You'd only have a city uh, in, in the world. Um, that's a thing you could do with this. Uh, you could uh, verify other claims about the training process, and the same FlexHike hardware could also enable um, kind of less ambitious approaches to hardware-enabled mechanisms, uh, use cases like offline licensing and geolocation. 
Um, so here's why I think this is possible. Uh, this is like a, a, a high-level design for, uh, for FlexEgg. Um, there are basically six components. Uh, the first component is you need to have some kind of security perimeter, a physical security perimeter, which has sensors for all the possible ways that someone could try to break through the security perimeter, including thermal disruption, mechanical disruption, you know, kinetic, um, uh, electrical. Uh, you need to have uh, noise generation on that security perimeter in uh, you know, ultrasonic and uh, and electromagnetic domains to mask any potential leakage of confidential information through those channels. Um, but we live in a universe where, like, uh, uh, things have locality, like volumes are bounded by surfaces, and we have inverse square laws, and it just seems like it should be physically possible to actually just enumerate all the ways you could extract information from something and block them by generating noise. Um, then you need a self-disable mechanism so that if tampering is detected, then uh, the processor is no longer usable either for compute or for extracting the data. Um, and this can be done with lo having lots of e-fuses buried between layers of physically unclonable functions which generate the keys which are necessary to decrypt the memory. Uh, you need to have a processor, a coprocessor, which actually runs the uh, compliance mechanism. It doesn't need to be on a separate die. This is um, in the original design uh, uh, because we were thinking of, you know, we're going to demonstrate this with a current uh, uh, NVIDIA processor. But in a future processor, you know, you just have the secure coprocessor on the same die, like the Intel management engine is on the same die, but it's a separate thing, uh, separate domain, isolated domain that runs the policies. Uh, and then uh, uh, blocks the execution of code that hasn't been checked um, by this and, and signed off on by those compliance policies. That secure processor needs a way to receive from the outside world uh, the cryptographically authenticated rule sets every 10 minutes, um, which again could be broadcast and, and data dioded. Uh, and finally, the uh, uh, Flex eggs, when you connect them into a cluster, need to have encrypted um, uh, interconnect so that the um, uh, you know, computation can run across many processors and the secure processors need to connect to each other and verify cluster scale properties. Um, but there are a couple ways to do that, either by dynamically uh, attaching metadata about the uh, computations that have gone into each piece of data, or by statically verifying the entire cluster scale computation and then locally verifying that the local piece um, is, is a, is a uh, partition uh, of the global graph. Uh, I will stop there. Um, I don't know if I have any time for questions, uh, but no. <laughs> Thank you.